What about the no? What about the name, Kurt Stone Glacier? How'd you come up with that? Um, there was well, it was it was kind of a, a couple of different things. Um, the, there was a, a small glacier that I hunted in Alaska, and it was unnamed, and so just kind of came to be known as Stone Glacier, mm. and so uh, it was just kind of within a tight group of of friends that we had talked about where we were going and, and, but then the other, the other portion of it is when I first started the company, I really, there were two selling points. I told, I told my wife, Nicole, I said, okay, well, when we start this, this is going to invest this amount. It was $15,000. That's all I'm going to do. That's either, it's either going to fly or it's not. And then in the back of my mind, I thought, man, if I could take this $15,000 and, pay it back to our savings and turn it into enough money to buy a stone sheep hunt. Like that's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's a, nice. So here I am 11 years later having gone on a stone sheep hunt. And so I, I need to reevaluate. What my goals are. Welcome to the shoot to hunt podcast with your host, Ryan Avery, a registered Democrat who loves the six, five green more. And the Jacob O'Shaney, his beard is made of the gypsy pubes. But together, they make the number four podcast in all of the US and A a great success. It is a nice. Um, do you watch Borat, Kurt? <laughs> I have seen it from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we go over this every, every show, but our uh, marketing video guy, he's. He's got special talents. I don't know if it's special needs or actually special talents. But it's all, all the above. Yeah, it's definitely. He's got a lot of voices in his head. <laughs> the special needs gave him the special talents. <laughs> Food is not safe around him. No, nothing's safe around him. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. He's like, well, you met him. I forgot. Kurt met him. That's right. Yep. You spent yeah. a whole week with him. You saw how special he was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, all right. For those who don't know the voice, that voice, it's Kurt Roscoe. I know we've went through how you spell your last name and how we say your last name, but we don't name identify on the Shoot to Hunt podcast. Don't so discriminate. It's Kurt Roscoe until proven otherwise. Actually, we kind of do discriminate because if you're one of those he, his, them, you're probably not going to be in here. Yeah. Yeah. If you're one of them, you're probably not going to be on the podcast for I'm very sh- long. I'm sure they're not listening anyway. Yeah, they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> So, Kurt, welcome to the show. Ah, thank you. How's the, how's the weather over in beautiful Bose, Angeles? Actually, it's gorgeous today. It's nice. We're starting to have some summer here in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, there's uh, yeah. when we were over there, it was kind of uh, it was colder at night. We just came in that general area. We just came from a shooting school over there, and it was colder at night than I thought it would be. Is that is that the norm for mid July? No, no, I, I, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been a cold spring altogether. Even starting, I mean, even from April, man, we had a couple of huge snow dumps here, which was, I liked, but then it hung on all the way through May, even into June. And you guys got so, dumped yeah, on it's late. Chilly. You got dumped on late spring snow, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. We had a couple of big storms roll through. Interesting. Yeah. Which, did a lot for our grass. Everything's still green around here, which is pretty unusual for this time of year. Hmm. Well, the, maybe it maybe it just hopefully knocked out some of those Californians moving over there. <laughs> just, slowed, <laughs> just slowed them down. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> uh, I, I say that here too because it is it is definitely a, a thing in Bozeman and Coeur d'Alene. There is a lot of people moving here and there. Yeah. Yeah, no, there is. Uh, well, go yeah, way back. Yeah. I think I think we, me and Tanya, did the first podcast you ever d- did in your basement of your old house. I cr- if that's is that correct? <laughs> that is correct. So it's it's yeah. been a long time to catch up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, yeah, that was my first experience all the way around with it. Yeah, and you, I remember you were you you were not a big talker, man. You came a long ways, <laughs> long ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we'll find I, I don't soon. have my own podcast yet. So, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. When is Stone Glacier's podcast coming out? <laughs> the 
funny enough, that's that's the first time I've ever been asked that. Um, <laughs> I don't know that it's even on the radar. <laughs> well, Exo, Exo Mountain Gear has their, their podcast pretty popular. Yeah, for the hunting crowd. I mean, backpack companies. Aaron has one. I mean, yeah. when is Kurt going to rip off the Kurt Rassicott <laughs> <laughs> podcast? <laughs> uh, I think people would be disappointed. Oh, uh, dude. <laughs> I don't like, know. It lasted 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's what you say in those 15 minutes. That's true. Uh, yeah, like yeah, get right to it. Talking to form about you, like when you talk, people listen because you don't talk much, but when you do, it's usually something relevant. <laughs> well, I hope so. That's what my grandpa always told me. <laughs> so we've, we've, your origin story's out there, but we kind of touch on it for, you know, kind of for. I guess to tell the people who and what you are, you've basically, can you take us through, you started, you know, the, the cliff notes, I guess, if you will, you started as a welder and now you're a backpack manufacturer. How does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a, a roundabout way to end up to where I'm at right now. But, um, yeah, I was born and raised here in Montana and then went to school at Montana State, and got my teaching degree, and, and then went to Alaska, and I was teaching. So I taught up there for six years, and then ended up going to work on the North Slope uh, in the oil field in Prudhoe Bay, and first started up there as a welder. And and the transition there was it just, you were working two weeks on, two weeks off. You had a lot more time to be outside doing things, and then that's kind of what I was after. And then ended up getting into the power side of it and and working for the power company that was owned by British Petroleum up there. And then it was when I was in Alaska that I started playing around with trying to figure out backpacks, gear, just anything. And it it was primarily just from the perspective of, of trying to find something that was lighter that worked for what I was trying to do. So eventually I ended up in a spot where I bought a sewing machine and I wanted to make modifications to packs that I had and continued to work on that. And over the course of a couple of years, ended up with an entirely new design. Can I jump in there real quick and ask you, Yeah, what was lacking that you made? What, What were you hunting with that you didn't, not necessarily didn't like, but needed to change at the time? Well, at the time, there really weren't there really weren't many hunting specific backpacks um, because we're talking, Oh geez. What would have that been? The early two thousands. And so people were using, I, I would, I would say that the Barney's pack was the number one pack that was being used, especially in Alaska and those style of frame packs and you saw that with sheep hunters and everywhere and everything else. But then you'd start to see a group of uh, mostly sheep hunters that were using uh, mountaineering style packs, whether it be an Arcteryx and North Face. There, there were lots of different ones out there that they were using, but they were all made to carry 60 pounds because mountaineering, you're the, the heaviest you're ever going to be is when you first start off. Well, obviously not the case with hunting. And so they just weren't designed to carry a hundred plus pound loads. And so that's what I was using at the time because they were lightweight. There was the Arcteryx and the, and the North face packs that you could get. There were somewhere around 6,000 cubic inches, six to 7,000. They would be in that probably six, six pound range. If I remember right, somewhere mm-hmm. in that. So they were considerably lighter than a frame pack that would be in that 10 to 11 pound range. And they were a smaller footprint too. So you could keep it tight to your back when you're in alders, you didn't have things hanging up. It it was just a better program for what I was doing. But the problem is, is once you put over a hundred pounds in it, they had two, most of them had two aluminum stays. They were formable. They just weren't designed to carry that amount of weight. And so they worked, but I was really trying to get to that spot where I would have a pack that was somewhere in that five to six pound range that was designed to carry 115 to 120 pounds as comfortably as you could. And so that was, that's what was lacking in my opinion at the time. And there just wasn't anything being made from that, from that perspective. So that's, that's where the design portion started. And, um, so I 
worked with some different packs that were on the market and eventually came up with really close to the design that we're selling today. Um, same basic footprint, sizing, of course, uh, a lot of the smaller features, bags and all of that have, have, have changed over the years, have advanced, but what? by and large, it, it was, uh, yeah, same design. Were you, what was, what year was that again? So I'm going to say it would have been when I finally finished that design, it would have been 2011, 2010. Yeah, there was. I mean, I guess there was. On this thing on the hunting time, there was Kafarus were out and Everly Stock and Badlands is the only three I could really think of. Yeah, but, yeah. Mystery Ranch had some oh, at yes. that point too. MR had some. <laughs> yeah, but you're right on yeah. the heavy. They were both on the heavy. You know, Kafaru and MR. Yeah. The one thing about them, they're built like tanks. But the bad thing about them at that point in time, they're built like tanks. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, heavy. well, and that's it. And when you think about even those those back those those companies had come on just kind of through the the like the mid 2000s if i remember correctly but even when i first moved up there in the early they're just yeah yeah there there wasn't much dwight shoe pack i remember that one i still have <laughs> stuff I, is, yeah I, it's and going back and looking at them like how in the fuck did I pack anything out with that? And we packed a lot of elk with that thing. Huh. That old, yeah. molded, that was like that molded injected frame. That's when you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that was it. What about the no? What about the name, Kurt Stone Glacier? How'd you come up with that? Um, there was well, it was it was kind of a, a couple of different things. Um, the, there was a, a small glacier that I hunted in Alaska, and it was unnamed. And so just kind of came to be known as Stone Glacier. Mm. And so uh, it was just kind of within a tight group of, of friends that we had talked about where we were going. And, and, but then the other, the other portion of it is when I first started the company, I really, there were two selling points. I told, I told my wife, Nicole, I said, okay, well, when we start this, this is going to invest this amount. It was fifteen thousand dollars. That's all I'm going to do. It's either it's either going to fly or it's not. And then in the back of my mind, I thought, man, if I could take this fifteen thousand dollars and pay it back to our savings and turn it into enough money to buy a stone sheep hunt, like that's that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's a, nice. So here I am, eleven years later, having gone on a stone sheep hunt and. So I, I need to reevaluate. What my <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you could, though, if you wanted to. <laughs> well, yeah, I I suppose we all could at some point. Yeah. Yes. Once, yeah, yeah, it, it it becomes priorities. All I hear. Then you have a ten and a twelve year old, and you're like, yeah, well. I hear they're getting cheaper by the year. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So in the 2011 yeah. time frame, Kurt, is are you back in Montana at that point? Um, I was, yes. Yep. I was back in Montana. So I officially, that's actually right when I moved back. I moved back in 2010 and, and then, but I was continuing to work on the slope. I was still two weeks on, two weeks off working for British Petroleum. And, um, yeah. And so I guess, I guess move forward is, uh, got to a point where I had this design I approached a couple of different companies that were in the backpack or in the hunting world. And, and asked if they'd be interested in the design and everybody had their own designs. They, they, they had their own path forward. And, and so got to the point where if it was going to happen, I realized that I was going to have to do it. So that's, that's really where it came about. And so I started searching around for different companies that could manufacture it, trying to figure out how to do that. But for the low minimums that I was looking at, and it's 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 hard to twist somebody's arm to you know, the amount of time that it takes to put into a production run for such a low volume. Um, most manufacturers weren't interested, and but I was able to find one that was, and they were pretty hesitant. But man, I was calling them almost every other day, and finally I just said, "How about this? How about if I send you the patterns? I send you a finished product. I pay for the production up front." I pay for all the materials and I have them delivered. And, and I said, you don't have to do any design work. All you have to do is cut. And sew. that's it. And so they agreed to it. 
And so that's how I got my first 60 and then sold those in, I don't know, it was a couple of months and then just rolled that money right back in and I ordered a hundred the next time. Mm -hmm. And so once I placed that order for a hundred and had the material sitting on their doorstep again, then things, (laughs) things started working out with them. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We're serious. These origin stories are always interesting to me because you started in a garage. I met Jake when he was in his garage. What was like the, the aha? Or first, let me ask you another question. What, how many iterations did you go through before you had that pack that you sent them to, to cut and sew? Oh, it's hard to say. And here's the reason it's hard to say is that I was always fiddling with them. I, I, I love to build things, so it didn't matter if it was welding sewing ended up being very very similar to welding so all the pattern making using autocad and how you put it together boat building those types of things there there was a lot of things that transferred between the two so when i started sewing i just enjoyed doing it so i would take pack out for a hike if it was off season if it was during season whenever when i'd bring it home they're usually it was a rare occasion when there wasn't something i didn't want to change (laughs) <laughs> and I tear it apart and you know put it back together and that's the great thing about working with fabrics is that it's so quick to make changes and to test so it was kind of in constant development and change for probably two years yeah, and it was probably that initial two years of work that really set the framework for stone glacier in the future you had already resolved and, and refined most of the items you wanted to fix and you came out with a product that was ready to go yeah yep yep it it it, it did but it is funny, too, to, to look back at even the first ones. As a matter of fact, just the other day, we had one of the first 60 come through our shop. Oh, wow. And, and <clears throat> he sent it in, and uh, there wasn't anything wrong with it other than we've changed our design on our bag since then. And we just had to make a slight modification to add a couple of straps for him so he could, he could use our new bags. But... Yeah, by and large, the the footprint and and everything hasn't changed a lot. So, um, even most of the products that we produce today will still fit that one of those very first sixty, which is kind of that's been one of the things that I've tried to do, and we'll try to continue to do that in the future. Is when somebody makes an investment in that product and they want to upgrade it, we want them to be able to do that and not be in a spot where nope, this is obsolete. You're going to have to spend another $700 if you want to do anything. So we'll we'll try to keep doing that. Okay, getting back to you. uh, Started in your garage. Like I said, Jake, yours, the rock slide origin story is not that sexy because I had a fucking computer. That's all I needed. (laughs) And you were in your underwear. (laughs) I didn't have to put my pants on until noon. (laughs) But these origin story, what was... Because I, I, re- I mean, I kind of remember when I thought, oh, shit, this is going to be something at Rockside. And we were the same age because Stone Glacier's 2012 started, too. Mm-hmm. What was your guys' you and your wife's aha moment? We're fucking on to something here. Boy, I don't know if I really ever felt that. I always just kind of felt like I got to keep grinding. I, I didn't ever feel like, ah, I don't know that's a tough one to say because even after the first 60 after they sold there was kind of that relief thinking okay well good but you have to know that most of those first 60 are going to either friends or a friend of a friend so there's probably only two degrees of separation as, as that star <laughs> goes out so now i gotta reach out to you know everybody else how, how, how is this going to happen yeah. Um, did you have no, a website initially? Absolutely. Like when you moved those 60 and those hundred, did you, was there some type of website? Was it? There like, was. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 But I made it. So, mm. and I'm not a web designer, so it was a little <laughs> bit, and it, it was, it was, it was pre days with all these cookie cutter ones. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say probably back to your, your question, Ryan, it, it was after the first year where, you could you could start to see some flow from the business after the second season hunting season where you're selling things and you're getting good feedback and you kind of get over the the first i don't know uncertainty of of where you're headed i would say okay i think we have something here let's keep moving now let's let's set a a a tighter business plan huh how many years before you actually showed maybe you don't want to answer this but i 
I, I asked out of my own personal curiosity, how many years before you yep. actually showed profitability on the bottom line dollar on paper? Like when you file taxes, when did the business actually make money? Well, I think that's that's one of the interesting things, or not one of the interesting, but what's different about it is we showed that the first year. Oh, really? Because we had all that I ever invested was 15000 And so I didn't... It, that was it. So if when we went into the next one, but, it, but here's the thing is that I didn't ever take anything out of it either. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, so I kept my, yeah, that, I kept my full-time job. So it wasn't, I didn't start paying myself until the third year. So I put everything back into it and just kept rolling it. Like on our side, whether it be R and D or inventory, whatever it might be, everything goes back in. So technically we never show we never show profitability. Everything is reinvested, no matter whether whether it be through payroll, whatever it is. We technically don't make money. Yeah, yeah, and and so I guess along those lines, I would have been in the same position. Yeah, because anytime there was any cash, I was buying more inventory. Exactly. I mean, it didn't it didn't sit in the bank for a month before I was buying more materials and entering into another production run. The, that really drives my wife crazy because now she's responsible <laughs> for the for the, for the the accounting side. And, and she always, you know, obviously, you know, business, small business, biggest, you know, cash flow, ebbs and flows, things like that is uh, the real enemy. And I tell her the same thing. I said, I said, you're going to stress all the time about the cash flow because if there was 300 grand in there, it'd be gone. I'm not going to, we're not going to sit around, just let the money sit there. That's not how, the, that's not how you have the money make money. Yep. It's not making no money no, sitting there. No, we want, we want more products. We want more inventory. We want more. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, All right. For sure. All right. And this is a two part question The basically I've seen companies come and go. I've seen companies, you know, that st like stone glacier, you guys are here to stay in my opinion. And a lot of companies grow too fast. Was it always the idea you're going to go from backpacks to sleeping bags to shelters to apparel or kind of take us through your business plan for that first five to eight years? No, I would say for the first, for the first five years, it was just backpacks. And then it really got to a point where I had to decide what to do with it because it was becoming too large to continue to work up on the slope where I was and to run the business full time because it, it was getting to a point where it was a full time job as well. And, but it was a tough situation. Or it was a tough decision to make for me, just in that I was very invested uh, in, in my job on the North Slope. I really liked it. Uh, great benefits, pay. It, it was the whole package, provided half the year off. It just fit our lifestyle very well, so I wasn't I wasn't in a spot to to totally separate from that. So really, what I had to do is I had to decide, okay, what are we going to do with this business? And fortunately, at that time, Jeff Spazito came to me, and we had actually talked earlier, and he said, "Well, what do you have planned long term? Are you interested in a partner? Are you interested in moving forward with some other things, or do you just want to run it yourself?" And then that was at that point, I said, well, let's start to discuss what some options are. And so that was the first time that uh, he put together a great business plan that, that kind of <laughs> led us forward onto apparel. And yeah, those were all those were always dream projects for me that I would have loved to have seen Stone Glacier do. But in my position, I wasn't going to go out and look for financing just to run this project and then continue to try to just do it half time. It didn't work. You needed somebody else who was an owner who was involved and could run things from the business end. So it ended up being a great opportunity and a great partnership. And I mean, that's, we're still in the same spot today. So, and that was in the end of 2016, 2016, 2017, somewhere in there. And so that's, that's really, where we entered. And so he focused on the CEO president role of, uh, of running the day to day business and the direction of the company. And then I focused on product and production and development. And that's when we set our sights first on apparel. And so we put together our primary pieces for our apparel. 
and moved to sleeping bags and then partnered on the tents and just yeah kept filling in the gaps that's kind of kind of where we are even to this day well you kind of answered my follow-on question is you know i haven't seen any you know real turds from you guys like you know recalls or problems with something you guys have made pretty thing pretty much everything you make is i wouldn't say it's a home run i mean you'd know better than i but pretty you haven't made any real turd yet i guess and i guess that's going back to jeff (laughs) and you look like like let's be honest there's another company in your in your genre that has made some turds early on and it it made a life rock slide really difficult (laughs) so yeah, uh, yeah. Th- th- you haven't done that and I haven't seen any big mass. Well, we got to return these because we have this issue. So whatever you are doing is working. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that we're turd free at this point. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. though, Kurt, there's, you've seen companies yeah, make I this do. guy and they're like, Oh fuck, we got to recall half of these or, or our, you know, our freaking crotches are blowing out or our frames are snapping yeah. in half. That's, you know, running Rockside, you see it all good or bad. And you guys have not been in that situation, which I applaud you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. It, um, it takes, yeah, it takes a lot of effort to, to make sure that, that every little detail is taken care of. I know you guys know that extremely well, knowing from, from your product side. So, and a lot of times it takes extra time. And I think that that's, that's the tough thing because you can't come to product as, or you can't come to market with your product as soon as you want to. And that has to be something that you're okay with uh, from a company standpoint to delay and make sure that it's done to the product brief, to the, to the spec that you initially started on. And um, so, yeah, I, I hope that we can continue that, that path. So Ryan was telling me that you carried a 3378 14-pound <laughs> rifle for 28 days in the mountains to kill a sheep. Is that true? <laughs> well, it's pretty close. Uh, so you it, said, so what, was, uh, what amazed me by this story is that here's a guy who put all this time into making an ultralight backpack, and then he goes and carries a 14-pound rifle 28 days in the mountains. I just thought that was kind of like opposite ends of the spectrum. If, yeah, it is. So... Uh, you're you're close on that one. Okay. It was a uh, 378 Weatherby, and it was right about 10 pounds. It was just oh, a little under not, 10 pounds. It's not that bad. And, yeah, yeah. So, but those were in the days where, uh, so I got that rifle when I first moved to Alaska, and there were there were several different renditions of it, uh, and I ended up with a carbon barrel on it at one point and and so i had the weight down pretty reasonable on it but i just wanted one rifle that i could hunt everything in alaska with and of course and even to this day i think uh there's the adage the bigger the better in that state and so that's that's what i had landed on and that's what i carried for everything and that and i also did that then when i moved back to to Montana, but that's when I rebarreled it to a 3378, mm-hmm. uh, just to improve the ballistics a little bit more. And, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, I, you're absolutely correct. I was not carrying the lightest weight rifle that I could have been at the time when I was trying to carry the lightest weight everything after Kurt, that. Kurt, was that loaded? Because those bullets are like a pound a piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, you got to take us, you said, you told us this story on when we did the Avery Venture ones with you, but you got to tell the story about how you shot that Ram to do it justice to Jake. Cause I told him I may have embellished. I may not have about the unlimited Ram you shot. Can you take us through that story real quick? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had, well, long and short of it is I'd been in there how oh, eight or nine days at that point and I hadn't seen anything. And I'd been in this one glassing spot for two days. And so I decided to move to another spot. And there was this group of elk that, that were in the area. And, and there was also a, a elk rifle season at that point. And so the way that I wanted to go was through these elk. And But it just felt wrong because I didn't know if any other hunters were in there. I just wasn't going to go through and blow them out. So I dropped down through the timber, down through this little cliff band and went around. And as luck would have it, I 
bump this sheep out of its bed that was probably only a quarter mile from where I had been camped. And all that I could see is a rump, white stripes down the leg, and it was a, a sheep went down through, cut back to the left, and was gone. And it was a pretty good size track, and it was alone. So I was thinking, oh, I probably just bumped around. So anyway, so I continued down through the timber, got to the other side, and that night I looked back across, and sure enough, here's this eight- or nine-year-old ram right back over where I'd been glassing the two days before. <laughs> So this was right at dark. So I ended up breaking camp. I don't know. It was about four o'clock in the morning. It was a couple hours before light because I knew it was going to take me a while to get over there. So I got over there just after light, located the ram. He was in this cliff band, fed down in, uh, bedded down in the shade. And so that's when I pulled the pin, went around, all the way up and around. It took me till about six o'clock uh, that night to get into position. And I was glassing down in and I found the bed that he had been in. And it was in the sun by this point, so it kind of made sense he wasn't there, but I didn't know where he was. And I glassed and glassed and glassed, and right at dark, well, no, in between there, he had actually came out and moved across this little avalanche chute, but it was really short window. And I was just sitting behind my spotting scope, had no idea that he was going to show up. Saw him for 10 seconds, whatever it was, and then he disappeared into the timber. So then I spent the rest of the evening right until dark trying to locate him. I was just moving up and down this ridge, probably 10, 15 feet at a time, set my glass down again and just pan through everything. And I ended up finding him behind this big pine right at dark. And he was bedded in, the, I think he was 410 yards. And he was bedded quartered towards me. No, quartered away from me just a little bit. But his head was towards me. And... The winds, the thermals had finally laid down. It was pretty calm. And I just figured, I mean, there was timber for the next mile, the direction that he was going. So I thought, well, this is your one opportunity. You're probably not going to locate him again. And so I got laid out and took the shot. Of course, I had a muzzle break. Dust flies up through the scree. Can't see anything. Sheep's not there. And then just down... About 30 yards down was this other cliff band, and I just saw him roll through there, all four legs straight. You know how they do. And I thought, okay, well, that's that's a good sign. <laughs> so I ended up getting over there uh, quite a bit after dark, and it, it kind of channeled him down into this chute. So I just followed that chute down, and I found him, and he was there. And so I got to looking at him, and I rolled him over, and I thought, oh, my God, what did I do? Well, ended up shot him right above his eye. <laughs> and and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I looked down on his shoulder. And then there's uh, there, there's also an entrance wound right, right on the tip of his shoulder into his lungs. And I could not for the life of me figure out what was going on that night. I thought maybe he had just you know, cut his eye or whatever, but no, sure enough, it must've been right before I made the shot. He moved his head down or must've brought his head down and it, yeah, it went right through his eye, through the cranium and then into his lungs. And, uh, wow. yeah, so it, it was over pretty quick in, in that situation, but, uh, was not intentional, but <laughs> that's where you're aiming. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's where I was aiming. Did it break the skull plate? No, it didn't. It went that's in amazing. just just like, um, and I'm I'm talking like in the eyelid. So mm -hmm. it went in the the right below that that brow portion, and then out kind of the backside of the head, and right through the the brain cavity, and then into the into the shoulder. Yeah, so stoned him. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty lucky. So then, Ryan was saying this was. is this is basically like an. Uh, it's a sheep hunt that anybody can go do. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I thought we that have. was pretty amazing. All the, all the sheep stories that I hear about, you know, $25,000 tags and all that good stuff. It was, it was pretty nice to hear that you can still work your ass off and go find a sheep. It is. It is. I think that that's <clears throat> the coolest thing about it. So to my knowledge, and we've talked about this before, it's the only place that anybody in the world can buy an over the counter sheep tag. So, in that it, you don't have to be a resident, U.S. resident, anything. 
and we there are five units in in the state of montana and they're all set up on a quota system most of them have a quota of two rams and the season starts september 15th and then runs through the end of rifle season which is typically the well it is it's always the sunday after thanksgiving so it's a long season uh it's not limited to weapons so it's rifle or bow and many of the units often don't ever close so they don't find two legal rams in you know, almost four months. Mm. Sometimes they close on the first day. Uh, you just don't, you just don't know. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really cool opportunity. Odds are pretty low. So last time we ran the, the, the success rate, it's, you know, in between one and 2%. And, um, but they're self-sustaining. And I think that's the cool thing about it is they've been going on for, and I think it's over 50 years. Are, and are there legal rams yeah. in those units that they're not killing any? Yeah. No, no, there are, there, there are. And so legal ram, while they, it's not based on age by any stretch, but in that five to six year range is usually when they'll hit the, the Montana, uh, legal horn requirement. So they're not particularly old rams to, to be legal but they're they're pretty cagey and they're you know it's a really big country um they spread out the other thing that i think is really unique about these areas is that by and large these these populations these rams in particular will will move around between the areas that that they use so a lot of times in the breaks or in the special draw units that you see in the state sheep will, will go back to the same areas quite often and and you don't really see that that much do so you meet many other Gilgata, guys up there like yourself like the hardcore i'm gonna i'm gonna be up here for four weeks if i have to you meet many guys like that um i've only met a couple of guys on hunts up there so the last two years haven't seen anybody any other hunters but have lots of friends and acquaintances that you make just through doing it for the last 15 years that yeah there are there's there's a there's a small group of guys that it's their thing and they love to do it they'd rather go do that than anything else and they spend a lot of time in there and then there's there's a majority of the guys that i think just enjoy hunting anything and it's a great opportunity to to go hunt sheep so it's a little bit of both well, on the uh, we'll get back to the unlimited thing in a minute. The uh, what I want to talk about was going from a three seventy eight. I met you a few years ago again, and you were shooting a six Creedmoor, and then I met you this year, and now you're going to the mighty six UM. You don't know how fucking proud that makes me, Kurt. <laughs> you drank the Kool Aid. You drank the Ryan Kool Aid. Hey, I didn't say anything. I let him shoot it. Uh-huh. I said shoot it. And you do what you think. Yeah. And uh, he happened to have a six millimeter barrel, which is half the answer. Yeah. But anyways, Kurt, take us through that, you know, the years of the, you know, 378 hunting probably in Alaska to the six Creedmoor to the six UM and anything else in there in between. Yeah, no, that was, that's, that's been pretty much the thing. I mean, outside of the six Creedmoor that I had and the six five that I've had, that I've had the last, I guess, almost two years Man, I think everything else for the last 25 years I've taken has been with that 378 or 3378. So, yeah, it's been a big transition. But, yeah, I think in the beginning, it, it was always, I don't know, you, you, you do, you do what, what people suggest from an experience standpoint. So when I first moved to Alaska and, and I was interested in hunting brown bear and I was going to be, sheep hunting and moose hunting in areas with brown bear the suggestion was always you need to be carrying a 375 h and h or 338 wind mag was also very popular just that type of round and so i was like well hell if those are good then a 378 has got to be better right <laughs> so that's how i ended up with that and i stuck with it for years but i think more recently being able to go through some of these trainings and and better understand from the experts wound channels um 
shooting techniques, uh, shooting out of position. And man, the big one for me is spotting your own shots. And I never spotted a shot from my 378 or 3370. I mean, I can't remember when you pulled the trigger is, it was kind of an entirely new reset. You got to build a new position. Um, the concussion, the break, just got in all of those things. It was really hard. I know that you can do it, but I couldn't do it on a regular basis. And especially in the heat of the moment or out of position. So being able to be behind, be behind some of these rifles and know exactly what's going on, exactly where you're hitting, being able to make corrections. And to be honest, I, I think I can make two more accurate shots with either one of those sixes or six fives, then I can one shot with the 3378. So it kind of ends up being a one hit wonder. If it doesn't fall down the first time, I don't even know what correction to make. And so I think it was just some of those logical decisions that have started to push me the other direction to just try to be more efficient and you shoot them more. So, um, yeah, I think it's just being be a better shooter. Mm -hmm. When you're a solo hunter, spotting your shots is hugely important. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I yeah, everybody hears me tout the six UM, but I think that what it can do for the recoil and what you get, you're getting a Magnum, you know, in a, in a like a six five Creedmoor recoil. So that's probably yeah. probably its best attribute. You can spot your own hits, and you have enough ump to get out there a ways. And now you got this little baby ass sixteen inch barrel is about to show up, and you're gonna try oh, it with yeah. that, right? Yep. <laughs> Putting a little 16 inch, probably 16 and a half inch barrel on it. The extra half inch counts uh, for sure. That's what they say. <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> oh, man. So Kurt is has a, a Tika and a barrel here, and he's going to get a 6UM built in, over the next couple of weeks. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to uh, see how it progresses and see how Kurt does with it. Mm -hmm. Oh. Boy, not as excited as Kurt is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I don't know if you remember yeah. last year, Kurt, I talked to you um, about shooting, and you said over the last, I think it was three to five years, you've gotten a lot better at shooting, and you said you needed to. I don't know if you remember that. It was like It was a fleeting conversation. I barely saw you last year at that shooting school. So Kurt, the yeah. shootist, what's changed? I mean, why, why did you, you know, seek out education in shooting? Um, well, I think the first thing was I had opportunity and, and once, um, once I had met a few of these guys that, that have done it for a living, um, that train, you started to realize how little I knew and really how little I practiced. So, and, and I think other guys have seen this where if you're an archery hunter, you might be shooting likely shooting your bow almost every night through the summer and i thought about how many times am i picking up my 378 going out and shooting positional how many times am i um checking all my dope uh, just getting rounds down trying to practice and become more efficient and i wasn't it was that typical thing of make sure that your rifle's on you feel confident with it you know, your velocities and then you'd go hunt. And it, it, it was just a, it was a gap for me. And then once I got the opportunity to, to go on that first clinic three years ago, then I really realized how much or how little I knew and how inefficient I was in, in those situations. And it really motivated me. So I think that's, that's where it all started. And, and, it's it's really enjoyable <laughs> and it's really challenging so to to continue to get better and yeah so I, I think i think that that's kind of where it all started was just feeling like i i wasn't i wasn't as good as i could be yeah when you you know i grew up i've been shooting since i was eight years old and when the military i shot not as much as people think when you're in the military but i did shoot in the military and then you you get out and you think you're something and then you're actually put to the test and you find out outside of maybe in the prone, you pretty much fucking suck at shooting. It's, it's kind of uh, depressing at first. You get your sticker. It is. There. It's super humbling. 
<laughs> it, it rarely is. And you're like, well, and, and we do as humans, we only practice what we're good at. And uh, you can tell that I don't do a lot unsupported. I don't do a lot offhand. I don't do a lot of sitting supported. I pretty much shoot in the fucking prone. And if you take me out of that comfort zone, I suck. So that that is the reason I think why I, and I imagine you seeking more education on it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah. And just, just being more confident in, in the situation. I feel like getting to that point where it's just muscle memory and you're not having to think about every little step that you need to take. And then you can focus on just the task at hand. You know, what is your dope? What, what is my wind call going to be? And you're not fiddling around with all the rest of it. And there's just so many advantages and then it makes you quicker, makes you more efficient. It does. I mean, we're out here, we're practicing all year to make this shot on an animal and we, we rarely, you know, go all through all the scenarios that can happen. And I think that's the biggest thing that I learned at these, this little clinic that Forum put on is you can, you know, people that say they rip off their shit and get a shot off in, in 20 seconds are lying. Because when we, yeah. when we did that, most of the shots were a minute, minute plus. And uh, sometimes, yeah. obviously, the animal dictates they ain't going to stick around for a minute. So you got to practice now getting your, you know, hunt in hunting scenarios. I ambush hunt a lot. Uh, uh, Jake ambush hunts a lot. But the last two years, I've been walking and bumped animals that I've ended up shooting. So that practice is, <laughs> you can't learn it in the moment. So you better get on it now. Yep. No. No, I, I completely agree. And it's it's in, yep. also interesting to me, and you can add your 10 cents, is you can get really good quickly and you get really bad quickly. It's very perishable. Oh, that's the best way to put it. Yeah, because, yeah, I, I've, I've noticed that just in, especially in your process and your form and all of those things, because that's what plays into it. One little thing, are, are, are you in good position to, to manage the recoil? Well, no. Then did you see your shot? No, you couldn't see your shot because you couldn't manage the recoil. So there's like this, this tumbling effect of, okay, well, I made this one mistake and now the whole thing went to hell. And um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. It goes quickly too. We did this walk around thing, Jake, where basically there's teams and you get to pick the shot and then you go first and everybody has to follow you. It's pretty interesting to see how everybody sets up. Like nobody has the same exact setup uh -huh. and it's, it's kind of funny to see who, what works and what doesn't. And you can tell the people that have tried different positions because they're pretty successful in lots of different areas yeah. to where you get me. And if I can't get in the prone, Oh fuck. It's like, the, it's like it's the a basketball circus. game of horse, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you go around, you yeah, make some yeah, trick yeah, shot and yep. shit. Somebody has to do it just like you. Yep, it's a game of pig. I'm, I did, uh, Mason probably told you, but it's it's interesting to the people that are versatile, the people like me that weren't. Mm -hmm. So, oh, not yeah. me. I'm the best shooter. <laughs> Kurt, we have got next year. Jake has got to come. Do you not agree? Oh, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah it's <clears throat> it's great. And you know the funny thing about it is, so this was my third year. And you think you kind of know the program You're like, okay, well, I'm going to do better this year. Right. I, I know this drills coming up, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to practice a little bit and then we get out there and we do it. And the hunter shooter drill from the four positions is just an ass kicker. And you just kind of, at the end of it, just feel like God, I can't believe they even let me carry around. The <laughs> like this, this, this did I'm not go a how weapon. I had planned this it. is crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, you couldn't have said it better. That, I'm like, I have a sticker on my little microphone thing that says "Caution: I fucking suck at shooting," and I think everybody <laughs> needs one of those stickers the first day because to a man, we all sucked at something. Yeah. 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 Well, all right, yeah. on to a different topic so we can get you out of here. Uh, you, your claim to like your your whole claim to fame was like load shelves on backpacks. That was your niche. And then last year you came out with the terminus 7,000 and an add on to it. It's a 40 or 86, 84 this year, 86, yeah. 86 on the terminus. And you said you built the terminus last year when I did the video with you for yourself. So what had changed in your mindset? Is it the ultra light? Do you like the internal frame? Is it more comfortable or is it just more options? So 
really where it started was I was trying to come up with something that was slightly lighter. Now, I'm the first one to admit that if you drop nine ounces on a pack, you're probably never going to notice that long term. But if you kind of approach your whole kit that way, ounces make pounds. And so this was just kind of part of that process. And so what I was trying to do is come up with something that I would use that was specific to alpine style hunting. So that being any of those game animals that are goat, sheep, mule deer, that you're going to bone out. And so you're going to be rolling out with 60 to 70 pounds of bone meat, uh, cape and head, and a long range type gear set. So like a, you know, 10 to 14 days, that type of trip where you'd have a, a really lightweight sleep system, um, all of, all, all of that encompassed. And, but what I started to look at is, okay, even when you use the load shelf, the load shelf is super flexible in the respect that you can carry quarters or you can carry bone meat. But bone meat, you always want in the same general position. About four inches thick, the height of the frame. That's going to be your best support, create the least amount of leverage on your body as you're packing it out. So that truly doesn't require a load shelf for bone meat. Really, it requires a positioning system, uh, an internal load cell. And so that's what I started with with that is I thought, okay, so what if I can combine the pack combine the bag, combine the load shelf frame all in one, I can start to remove some of the fabrics and materials from it to create it specifically to carry bone meat. So really, if you look at the terminus, it is our frame pack with a bag sewn directly to it with a load cell sewn directly into it. So it's it's really doing the same function, but because you're able to combine those three components, you're able to remove fabrics, webbing, sewing, seam tape, all of those things to make it a lighter platform. And then that combine it with a fabric that, that functions better at elevation with the UHM WPE. Then you started to creep up on this. It has an entirely different uh, uh, set of features for specific al alpine and so that's that's really where where it started because it functions the same with bone meat that a frame pack would with with a load shelf just does it lighter that makes sense so you are 100 percent using that terminus that's your pack oh i do i I don't during, uh, when, when it gets into November and I'm hunting elk, I normally don't, um, just cause I like the flexibility. I really like my sky archer. The other thing that I like about it is that for elk hunting, um, late when it gets really cold, I'd prefer the Cordura to the UHM WPE. Mm -hmm. Now, once, once you, once it's seen some days of use, it loosens up a little bit so that that laminate becomes more pliable and it's not. It's not as noisy, but I do like the Cordura uh, for late season. It is a little bit quieter. And I do, I also like the flexibility of having a load shelf because um, if you ever do need to throw a quarter in, I'd prefer not to pack bones out. But there have been times where I've thrown quarters on or, you know, move locations or whatever you might have it, that offers some, some flexibility there. Well said. You sold me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hey, will the Terminus yeah. 2024 edition have any side pockets? I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, no, no, oh. because they're being made right now. But you, you might tell that friend that that. Um, that suggestion has been taken to heart. Oh, and, I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not falling on deaf ears. All right. Anything else you want to add on your pack line before we jump into your unlimited hunting? Do you want anything? Jake? Yeah, I wanted to ask him before you get into your kit, Kurt. What uh, 
What are your top three selling products at the moment? Um, so our Sky 5900 has been our top selling pack for years, mm-hmm. um, probably three years. And it continues to be just because I think it's, it's the most versatile pack for the Northwest Hunter, where you can do three to five day trips. You can shrink it down to day trips. You have the frame. And, and so that continues to be one of our most popular, um, our de Havilland pants are uh, our highest volume as far as numbers. Um, and actually, our de Havilland lights are right behind those. So um, guys really like our pants. So what, what was the other uh, name of the I, pants? Oh, the de Havilland yeah. pant and then the de Havilland light. Okay, so the okay. de Havilland light is based off of the same patterns. It's just a slightly lighter weight fabric for earlier season. Uh-huh. Um. And then our sleeping bags, um, our zero and our 15 are our next popular, okay. which is kind of bad, honestly been a surprise to us when we first came, especially on the gear perspective, you'd think that an apparel piece or you know, somebody will own multiple shirts or they'll own multiple pairs of pants. They mm-hmm. typically don't own multiple sleeping bags. Yeah. So you think it's the weight or what is it about the bags? Do you think is most appealing to the, the consumer? Well, I think it's the combination of, of the fabric and down uh, and, and just the temp range. So we are conservative on our temp range. Uh, we don't list the extreme as the advertised range. So they are a warm bag. So in, in zero, they're going to hold zero. The other thing is we went with a slighter, slightly wider cut through the shoulders gave it a little bit more volume inside the bag. Some of the mountaineering bags to shave weight end up with a pretty narrow uh, sleep channel in them, and it can be kind of constricting. Mm-hmm. But I think between those two things, that's that's probably what... And, and our price point is, is you know, right, right in the middle. Not the most expensive, but um, reasonably priced for the, the feature set. Ryan tells so me I that the uh, the Grumman jacket, the down that you use in the Grumman, it is the Grumman, right, Ryan? Yes. Yeah, the Grumman, and I th- and then I did my own research, and then you got a Grumman light coming out or just came out. Um, yeah, the we down, do. The down in there through Ryan's testing, which he's he beats the shit out of gear, so that that down was the most uh, what do we call it moisture resistant while maintaining loft and so yes, on and by far, yeah, yeah, well. Well, that, that's great to hear. And, the, and it's also the same down that we use in our sleeping bags. Okay. So they do fight moisture quite well. As a, as a matter of fact, it's the, the same fabric and down that are used on our Grumman. As that's what we use on our sleeping bags. So it ends up being a pretty good combination. Nice. What, uh, would you, Kurt, would you, Kurt, Roscoe, not Rassicott, <laughs> take, <laughs> take, that stuff to Kodiak Island sleeping and your insulation insulation layer, no problem. Would you do that? Oh yeah, I, I would do that. Yeah, absolutely. So would I. So would I. Yeah. I always hear you know down these a lot of down phobias, you know, and, and there is difference. I just did that podcast on the treated down on Rockside, and your your stuff is, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I mean, I know you didn't make the down and you didn't treat the down, but you put it in there, and it's you can't. I think I think uh, Form finally said that his after four and a half or five years his finally wets out a little bit, but I have yet to see that. And if you go watch your rewarming drill, they're freaking warming up through all that base layer being you know soaking wet. It's all coming through that down, and it, they had no problem. So, in my opinion, yeah, you're pretty freaking safe using that stuff in wet environments. Yeah, no, I would agree. It, it takes a lot to make it fail, and and and. While we've always known that, just <laughs> one of the easiest ways to see it is to try to wash one of our sleeping bags. Just try to get the down wet. It's it's an undertaking because you have to keep pushing the air out, and you have to just the amount it takes to to for it to lose all of its loft. Um, yeah, it gives you more confidence you, in the field. You guys wash stuff. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Rarely. Yeah. I always think of my, just my oil is kind of like a duck duck oil in the water. It just runs off, man. Uh-huh. It's just an extra coating <laughs> of protection. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a rare thing. Uh, <laughs> all right, get into your the solo hunting and the unlimited. Um, I, I asked Patrick Smith Kafari one time if he uh, ever got lonely, and he said no. He has lots of voices in his head. He never got gets lonely. <laughs> so <laughs> my question is: mental hacks for hunting solo. Do does Kurt? You know, do you get lonely? Do you ever feel guilty? I mean, what are the mental hacks to stay out there for that long? Um, oh man, that's a good question. I honestly, I, I miss my family. I miss my kids. I miss my wife. I'm like everybody else. It, I, I think if you go 14 days and don't miss them, <laughs> then, then you're probably not as connected as, as you might want to be. But, um, I think a lot of that comes into setting the stage beforehand. So like everybody knows that I'm going to be gone. Make sure that your work's done. Just remove the things that are going to weigh on your mind. And there's just the expectation that I'm going to be gone. It's not like I call in one day and say, oh, I'm going to be gone for the next two weeks. You guys handle everything. Good luck. So I think that, yeah, yeah. I think that having a good plan before you go into it, then you remove all that other bullshit from your mind. And then the only thing, the only task at hand is being efficient while you're out there. Sticking to your plan, doing doing the things you need to do. And, um, but as far as getting lonely, not really. Uh, when I first started hunting by, I like being by myself. Uh, I wouldn't say I prefer it, but at times I do. I think that, that I look forward to going for 14 days to, to unplug. Um, it's almost like a long meditation at some point, you know, you, you kind of break the habit of, you don't, you don't wonder if you got a text or you don't have to check your email or all of those things after three or four days leave your mind. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's when I really start to enjoy it. So I think the only hack is you just have to do it. And, and I've always, I've always been comfortable and, um, yeah. So I don't know if there's a hack outside of, of just going in and experiencing it. Do you come up with any, uh, ideas for gear while you're back there oh always i would say a majority of them not a that's that's strong i wouldn't say a majority of them but the things that i take i take intentionally and i bring a little notepad with me and i take notes if i come up with something or put the notes down in my phone and um but yeah a lot of things come from that because you you have to use this stuff to figure out where where to make improvements or where the shortcomings are and sometimes it's not as simple as just a seam blows out well that's simple i need i need to do something different with the construction sometimes it just doesn't function exactly how you want it to and then doing some of the problem solving so yeah it leaves a lot of time for that and one of the the other thing that i really look forward to is i look forward to reading at night in my tent i don't know it's just super calming grab a good book about some of the badasses in the 1880s that were out exploring this country that we're in right now and read about that. I, I, that that's a real enjoyable part for me too. So it's all nonfiction. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, backpack. I'm going to guess it's the terminus. Yep. And have you, yep. are you staying at the 7,000? Are you going to the 86? I don't. Yeah, I've, I just have the, the 7,000 right now. Um, I haven't really made a decision if, if I'd switch that up. I don't really have any reason to right now. So I'll, I'll probably just stick with the 7,000 this year. You probably know a guy. You could probably get an 86 if you wanted one, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> If I'm kind. <laughs> oh, every, like this is like the, one of the hottest topics every, or threads on Rockslide or forums, I should say, is sleep system. What is your sleep system when you're in the unlo- on that unlimited hunt? So my sleep system is I carry um, our Chilku quilt and then I carry an Xtherm and, and then our Solus four season one man tent. And 
I don't know. My philosophy on this stuff has always been, especially on these solo long hunts uh, at elevation where you're going to have wind. You just have some, you can almost every year you see snow at some point in that mid September time range. So having, having a, a shelter that can buck wind and is his case is your last line of defense. So that's, I'm, I'm willing to carry a little bit of extra weight to have a four season freestanding shelter opposed to some of the smaller one man. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's my kit. Are you a pillow guy or no? Yeah. Well, I didn't used to be, I always used to take extra layers and stuff them in a stuff sack and it just sucked. It was always uncomfortable. And then I think I'm trying to remember the one that I bought, but there's this little blow up pillow. It was something like 1.8 ounces. Like a and I got something? that and it was life changing. It was. Yeah. And it has the soft yeah. face on it. Yeah. One side's so soft, one side's on. not. Yeah. Yeah. I Dude, know. I totally changed my sleep game. I slept so much better. So, yeah. I'm that's, with that's you there. What I carry now. Jake and I are both with you. You got to have a pillow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Food system. I mean, you're, you don't look like you eat much. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Somebody get him a sandwich. <laughs> get, get that man a sandwich. <laughs> oh man. So um what I've gone to and actually I've been doing this for quite a while is everything I take, I try to take things that can be rehydrated in the event that you don't have fuel or you don't have time to set up. And so what I've been doing is um, it'll be all bars, um, those type of on the go food for everything up until dinner. And so there's, there are so many bars that are out on the market right now that have balanced, you know, balanced carbs, balanced, uh, proteins, fats that, uh, that I like. And I like the fact that it's just quick. And, and then in the evenings, I'll, I'll usually I, I alternate back and forth between some sort of noodle dish and then some sort of uh, um, freeze dried. But I try to take the freeze drieds that once again can be rehydrated. So mm. it might take an hour and a half for them to rehydrate, but there are some of them that just won't rehydrate. Right. Uh, a lot of the beef ones that have the beef fat in them. So I had a fuel canister last year. I went to screw, I take two fuel canisters, two of the four ounces. And and that's the only thing I use them for is cook that one meal. And man, I, I punctured the first one, mm. went to break it down the next day and it just puked all the fuel out after one. So I ended up having to eat half my meals cold, which I mean, really wasn't that bad. But if you had some of those beef ones or the ones where the fat doesn't rehydrate and you'd be hungry. Hmm. So that's what I try to stick to. What are the bars? Any any uh, winners? Yeah, yeah. So I've tried to I've tried to go to bars. So there there are some bars that you can get that are super high caloric per ounce. So running in that hundred calories per ounce range seems to be a sweet spot, and a lot of them are under. But you can get some that will run up into the 125, 150 gram or calories per ounce on the bar, but they're really high in fats. And I do find that when I eat those ones that are really high in fats, it, it kind of just bogs me down and mm. you know, stomach ache, or you just don't feel like you have the energy. So I try to stay in a balance of that. So, uh, I take, uh, different types of protein bars. I've taken the, um, green belly bars mm-hmm. before. Um, and I like those, um, I'm trying to think of the specific ones. Uh, so for the protein ones, I'll take some pure protein bars um, because they're pretty low in fat, but really high in protein. So it's a good way to get that protein during the middle of the day. And they're pretty low in sugars as well. But I found when you start going through that program, you really have to watch the sugars hmm. because when, when you're going to take in 1500 calories in bars, all of a sudden you, sh- you could be creeping up on, something like 150, 200 grams of sugar. And I just don't feel like I don't operate well in that range either. So trying to find that balance. 
Uh, and then try to take some grains during the day too. Um, I think it's pronounced Kamut, that wheat type snack. I really like that one just because it sticks with you a bit. So it has the, it has that carb and lightweight. I think it's 200 calories for two ounces. So it runs in that range too. So trying to balance those out, but I'm always looking for something new. Hmm. Kind of shake it up. I have seen those. I've never tried one. Yeah. All right. Water filter. Anything, anything weird, anything different? No, I just use the inline catadine. Um, and, and so what I'll do is I'll take four of the two liter platypus. Um, I think they call them, they technically call them their, their, uh, water storage system and not like a true water bladder, but have the one catadine that you can just go into each one of them. Cause some of those places I go into, you might need water for two days. So you'll load up, you know, eight to 10 liters of water to get into a spot so you don't have to drop down and get water again. So it's nice to just be able to, you can hang it up and you can gravity feed it into a clean one if you don't, or you can just keep it in line on your, on your hose with your mouthpiece that, that you can just drink right through it. So that, that seems to have worked well for me. It's lightweight. Just keep it from freezing, blow it out every night. Uh, weapons, we talked about it. You're going to God's cartridge. It's a 6 UM. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's going to have a proof barrel with the Hunt 26. Yep, Hunt 26. The 115s just showed up at the house. I got my mags for it. On a Tika um, action. Yeah, on a Tika action. Yeah, so, yeah, I think the only the only missing part right now are the dies, and I'm good to go. Dies, and then are you going, you're going to shoot the 115 D-Tech? I did, yep. Yep, I ordered 500 of those. And then what optics are you going to use? I'm a little bit up in the air on that, so I have I have a couple of different options. I have the, the 2.5 to 10 NXS Night mm-hmm. Force. I have a any, um, NX8 uh, Night Force, and then I have an Attacker. Gotcha. And and so any of those could go on there. I'm I'm leaning a little bit towards the NX8 right now, just just because you save a few ounces. But I I don't know. I've been shooting that Attack R more, and I really like it. Even <laughs> even though there's a little bit of a weight penalty on it. You're shooting it's the four to sixteen, over. correct? Yep, yep, yeah. four to sixteen. Gotcha. All right. On your optics, you're actually glassing. What what, what binocs are you using? Uh, I have the twelve, the Swaro twelve NL Piers. Um, yeah. And then you don't mess around, can't I have. You? <laughs> no, no I, they are so nice. Um, and then hopefully I'll have the ATC this year. Uh, that's that's what I have on order if inventory comes in. That's going to save my you spotting some, scope. That's going to save you some ounces. It is, and the the other interesting thing is that um, I have an ATX is what I've been using, and I really like it. But I found last year with those twelve power Swaros on a tripod, man, I only pulled out the spotting scope a few times, and so I just I just don't know that I need the bigger glass to do to do what I'm trying to do. So. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I've never, never sheep hunted, but I don't know. Do you have to count rings on the horns for those dudes, or is it like a full curl thing, or no. how does that work? No, yeah, not in Montana. So, uh, for it to be a legal ram, they draw a line in between the front base of the horn through any portion of the eye. So it ends up being somewhere, I would say, three fifths mm. to three quarters. So somewhere it's it, it's in that range. But of course, it all depends on the the curvature of the ram, but it's pretty easy to, to, to tell a mature ram. Gotcha. You, know, you don't have to, it's not like Alaska where you have to get in and count rings. Ooh, that ATC would probably be perfect then. Mm-hmm. I think so. All right. Your boots, what keeps you from getting blisters? Um, boy, that's a tough one. I'm still navigating that. So I, for the last few years, I've been using Arcteryx Acrux, ARs 
which is their mountaineering style boot. It's a double boot. And I really liked it because you could pull the liners out and throw them in the bottom of your sleeping bag. And every night you woke up to dry boots. Hmm. And th- that was sweet. But they don't make them anymore. And the pair that I have are shot. So hmm. funny enough, I was just looking this morning. There's a few different boots that are out on the market. I've always liked the La Sportivas. Um, they have some the G Tex, and they have a new G Summit coming out. That's a lightweight double boot, and that's probably the direction I'm going to go this year, if they're available in time. Um, yeah, so I, I've I've tried to stick with the synthetics and the double boot whenever possible, especially for late season or extended hunts, just because you can start out with dry feet. Boots are funny that way because I can't tell you what boot to wear and you can't tell me. You just got to kind of lace them up and figure it out. (laughs) You do. You do. Yeah, everybody has their own thing. Man, as long as you don't have blisters, it doesn't hold you up and you don't have cold feet. You're doing it right. So it really doesn't matter. I got feet like a hobbit. (laughs) I fucking, (laughs) there's pretty much nothing that really messed my feet up, luckily. You have body like a hobbit. I have a body like a hobbit, he says. A lot of fucking hair involved. <laughs> All right, Kurt. Uh, keeping keeping uh, sheep fit. What's the difference between Kurt at 25 and Kurt at 50? I have to work a lot harder. Um, the, yeah, when I was 25, 30 years old, I'd I decide it's a month from season and go do some running and and that was about all that it took. But no, I just think it takes it takes longer as we start to get older to or just it, it takes a year round commitment. And so that's where I've been probably the last ten years is just trying to get more scheduled with what, what exercise looks like and regimented about it. So it's every lunchtime. Make sure that that time's set aside. And it's just like anything else. Once you get into the habit, it's actually pretty easy to do. And the expectations are there. And so whether it's family or work or whatever, this is this is the time slot that I do this. And as long as that's set aside, then and, and I think it, it really helps my, my mental state as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, to get a little movement through the day. So yeah, it's um, when I work out, it's something similar. It's not CrossFit, but I think that that's, that's something that's the closest that, that people could relate to where, uh, working multiple lifts, moving from one to the next upper body, lower body, trying to keep your heart rate up over a hundred, um, alternating the, the, um, the muscle groups so that by the time you get through the fourth one, you're back around to the first one. And the muscle group gets a set a rest, but your heart rate stays up. And then as the weather starts to break in the year into the spring, you start to get out and do more outdoor outdoor training as well. Whether it be hiking under a pack or trail running or just anything to offer that cardiovascular. But yeah, as it starts to get closer to the season, getting underneath a pack with weight, I think, is one of the most important things that we can all do just because there is no way, in my opinion, to train for a heavy pack for multiple days other mm-hmm. than just doing it. I I agree. How often do you go over and get wrecked at Mountain Tough? <laughs> I, you know, I, haven't, I haven't been over there recently, but uh, I watch what those guys are doing, and yeah, they're getting after it. They are. They run through the parking lot every other day, and it... 90 degrees and it looks miserable. So I applaud them. <laughs> you applaud them from the air conditioning of your. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do. I'll wave at them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Final question for me, anyways, is what's next for Stone Glacier? What's on the horizon? Well, uh, in the short term, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, we normally release everything at the end of the year, but we have a few new products coming out here before hunting season, accessory wise. And one of them is a project I've been working on for quite a while is a scope cover. It's actually a scope and action cover. And it came down from just having some issues with debris and more so ice uh, and, and rifle failure. 
And so this is this is the product that I came up with to solve that issue for me. And I think that it's probably going to do well for a lot of other people as well. Is it? And, just, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, Hunt, go ahead. Does it cover the scope and action or just the scope or how does it work? Yes, it covers the scope and action. And and then it, it doesn't totally encompass the trigger guard, but uh, because it leaves the bottom of the trigger guard open, mm-hmm. but it, it does cover down over probably I'd say 90% of the trigger guards. So at least as far as debris getting up into the, the hole in the bottom of the action, even from the trigger, uh, it, it definitely helps with that. And it's very lightweight. It's only two ounces and it's foam padded. And then the exterior covering is waterproof, the three layer hydro shield fabric. And so it doesn't, and, and hydrophobic foam, so it doesn't absorb moisture like a foam would or a Cordura, or I'm sorry, a neoprene would or a Cordura. And very adjustable, so it'll fit on virtually any action, uh, whether it's a gas gun or a bolt gun or a chassis or you know standard stock. So we'll have that one in August. Oh, nice. And then... Yeah, we've added a few little things that don't seem like much, but I'm kind of excited about. Like uh, we added colors to our swing out pockets. I and I don't know why it's taken so long to do this. Seems like such a simple idea now, but if I count how many times I've pulled different swing out pockets or storage pockets out of my pack and had to open them all before I find what I needed. Um, so it'll be nice to to just have some color coordination so you know your kill kits in one or your emergency kits in another shooting kit whatever it is so we have some of that stuff coming up uh, in the short term and then uh long term we'll have our release in january for all of oh uh, we've just come out with our uh, just actually today released our black label product for this year and it's a black cirque jacket which is our synthetic prima loft synthetic insulated jacket anybody that might be interested so those are our new products for this year and then uh, in january we'll have several new uh, apparel pieces as well as some new colorways and new colorway in our gloves uh, in our rain gear line and then yeah just filling in some gaps in that area as well for those uh scope action covers are you guys courtesy direct to consumer only or can dealers such as myself carry like that that scope cover no, we have we have dealer programs. Okay, we'll have to yes. shoot you an email over about that. Yeah, let's do it for sure. When they when they come out, Kurt uh, <laughs> Forum said he didn't want one. He said just send one to me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's funny. He just sent me a text and said the same thing. Ah. <laughs> nice. Uh, Jake, you got anything else? Uh, no, this was uh, it was awesome. We appreciate you coming on, Kurt. Oh man, appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, we'll have to, uh, you know, get if you're ever passing through down the ninety here, headed towards Washington, definitely come in. I'll give you a tour around, and uh, like I told you about the the rifle setup. If you want to ship the rest of that in, we could definitely put a a complete package together for you before it ships. We could help with. Uh, I guess you're going to need some fire form brass and whatnot. If you don't have, I got to check into the die situation and see. I'll figure th- out how to get you dies. Wait, so so basically. Yeah. So we have Witten make custom dies, and in order for them to do to to honor dealer costs for custom dies, I have to send them the reamers. So there's a a resizing reamer for the resizing die, and then there's a chamber reamer for the cedar die. And they have to have both those reamers in their possession. So they have one, and the other may be soon, but I've already had some ordered. So I'll see what I can do about getting those okay. to you. Yeah, I told me yeah, he can yeah, borrow mine still- if he needs to. Yeah, Ryan, you have a set at home? No, the ones here. I'll say you borrow them. Okay. Get his shit going. Okay, okay. But yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out whether we got a forming brass for you and ship them size ready to load. For, uh, you're loading on your side? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't have any problem. Yeah, that would that, that, be easy. Okay. I mean, I could do all the load development and probably load for the entire season. In, yeah. Well, yeah, Ryan's in 570 data ought to get you really close. Yep. And 570 yeah. is very available on the market if you happen to not have any at home. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. That, that would be the winner. Kurt, any parting shots? Yeah. Shots, thoughts, same thing, I guess. Um, no, no, no. Just uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Great conversation. All right. Well, thank you, sir.
All right. And if you got any okay, questions, you if you got any questions for us, get a hold of us at shot shot podcast at shoot the hunt.com. I can't talk at the number end. two, we, not number one. We've talked too much. Yeah. Number two. Don't like, I just got one today. It's podcast at shoot to hunt.com. The number two, not the letters two. Yes. Thanks Thank for, you. Thanks for listening.